Stone Age. The longest period of human civilization. The Stone Age is the period from the emergence of humans to about 7000 years ago. Said period is when early humans wandered the landscape hunting and gathering food in small bands using and later making tools of materials such as wood, stone and bone. Subperiods Paleolithic. Basically everything from the discovery of fire to about 20,000 years ago. It includes a wide variety of things from primitive hominids with sharp rocks and pointy sticks to anatomically modern age. Sapiens Sapiens with tents, sewn clothes and multi-part hatchets who made elaborate cave paintings. Mesolithic. Roughly about 20,000 to 12,000 years ago, things begin to get more complicated. Tools get more sophisticated and specialized. Items such as bows and arrows and, in Asia, pottery shows up. Dogs and humans team up. Neolithic. About 12,000 to 7,000 years ago people began to farm. Slowly at first by weeding out patches of food plants as they went through and seeding areas with food plants and catching pliable animals. Penning them and feeding them before slaughter, killing the upper tea ones first. People figure out they can make plants and animals have desired characteristics by breeding them. They begin building permanent structures and eventually settle down and build small villages, then towns and eventually small cities. Some specialize and hone their crafts. Eventually someone works out how to smelt copper, thus bringing the stone age to a close. Note, these end dates are of a first past the post nature. The stone age did not end for everyone the second someone started making copper tools. Technically there are a few stone age peoples around today in odd corners of the world. North Sentinel Island comes to mind. Famously they shot two illegal and drunk Indian fishermen and a stupid American missionary dead by bow and arrow. The appeal of the stone age this is a time when the world was not yet man's dominion. Humanity was just another species struggling to get by wandering the world. Scraping up what they could from the land where they were not always on top of the food chain. It was also a time in which men walked alongside megafauna such as mammoths, ground sloths, woolly rhinos, short nosed bears and saber toothed cats. It even includes people dealing with other species of humans such as Neanderthals. If the idea of someone wandering a great empty wilderness of stark beauty and primal terror with real monsters getting by with only their wits and a few things they can cobble together from the wilderness interests you, the Stone Age is the place to set your games. More fantastic versions of the Stone Age include dinosaurs. This can fall into the fantasy trip of the lost world, which brings both Stone Age civilization and dinosaurs into modern times, albeit in a very hard to reach part of the world, such as deep beneath the earth, where travelers are forced to adapt to the savage and primal conditions they find themselves in. Or if you want to drop a giant black tablet from space and have it teach apes the basic principles of Minecraft, that works too. Stone Age inspired games. Factions and settings Planegia, Wolf Packs and Winter Snow, Worm, Werewolf, The Savage Age. Three main Stone Age factions in Warhammer Fantasy Battle are likely Lizardmen. Technologically, not culturally, Ogre Kingdoms, who are just about discovering the benefits of trade and tributes rather than smash with club and take all, depending on the tribe in question, and Beastmen. Some Warriors of Chaos can fall in this category too depending on the tribe with Hung being probably the closest to the Stone Age, along with any other chaos worshippers in isolated tribespeople around the world. Bronze Age. The Bronze Age is a period usually marked out by the development of bronze, an alloy of copper and tin and a period in which human civilization really got going. In the late Stone Age basic agriculture had been worked out and a few farming communities had emerged, Small permanent and semi-permanent villages and towns with a few workshops and storehouses surrounded by farmsteads. By the Bronze Age these had developed into fairly substantial and sophisticated societies with a high degree of specialization and stratification, complex governments, laws in place of customs and widespread trade networks reaching for thousands of kilometers. Writing and mathematics were developed as tools of governments and were used to build large-scale projects. At this time cities' populations grew into the tens of thousands, first as independent city-states and later as empires. 
Beyond these early centers of civilization newer of smaller scale agrarian societies would emerge and rise while nomadic pastoral peoples would develop along their own lines and would trade and fight with both the growing city states, the small scale farming clans and the remaining hunter gatherers. The more developed civilization soon came to see them as barbarians. Technically the Bronze Age was preceded by the Copper Age in which the basics of metal working were worked out and first applied and which developments in other areas were made such as construction and ceramics, but for sake of simplicity on this site it's getting lumped in with the Bronze Age. Copper smelting began 8000 years ago. Bronze smelting began around 5700 years ago in the Fertile Crescent and China about the same time and would spread from those two points although in 2013 tin bronze foil was discovered in the Balkans and dated to 4650 BC indicating that bronze may have been discovered independently in a much wider area. It should also be noted that bronze took some time to fully replace copper to tool use. Generally speaking, the Bronze Age ended in the Fertile Crescent region after the Bronze Age collapse, in which several old civilizations fell or were devastated as ferrous metallurgy began to catch on. When civilization recovered and rebuilt, new ones rose in their place. In China the end of the Bronze Age was more gradual and less dramatic, Iron working showed up and superseded bronze without too much fuss between 900 BCE to 500 BCE. Several Native American civilizations, such as the Incas and the Aztecs, would reach a Bronze Age level of development before the arrival of more advanced Europeans. Their development was hampered by a lack of large domestic mammals suitable for draft purposes or riding, and the lack of poxes from those animals would cause an accidental genocide as the colonial forces, on top of already destroying the Aztecs. With local helpers the Aztecs were arguably the biggest assholes in the Americas. Turns out human sacrifice of prisoners makes one resent it. Pretty much unwittingly committed the largest act of biological warfare in history. The Andeans had llamas, which was better than nothing but was no horse or ox. The Fertile Crescent. The earliest agrarian societies on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea and what is now Iraq, which saw the emergence of the first and the most successful Bronze Age civilizations, Mesopotamia, located in the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys. Mesopotamia is often called the birthplace of civilization. It was the site of the first agrarian communities in the Neolithic period and latter saw the emergence of city-states as we would understand them. Numerous cities would rise along the banks of these rivers, using it for transport and more importantly irrigation. This was a place with little rain and the rivers were rather unreliable. To make it productive, a lot of channels and ditches were acquired and you'd also want reserves of food set aside in reservoirs. Doing so was both labor intensive and required a lot of coordination. That said, properly managed it could support cities with tens of thousands of people, possibly more than a hundred thousand. There were numerous city-states in Mesopotamia, which would wax and wane in power. In particular there was Uruk, Akkad and most famous Babylon. Power would shift between priest kings to more military monarchs. In particular, this gave rise to the notion of the rule of law with legal codes such as that of Hammurabi, which was set in stone in steelies in public places for all to see. While it was rather brutal, an eye for an eye, it laid out the notion that there is one set of laws for everyone, even, in theory at least, to the king. It was filled with double and triple standards of course, but it was certainly better than the near literal no standards from before. There were several cultures which neighbored Mesopotamia, to the east in what was now Iran there various Bronze Age cultures emerging shortly after Mesopotamia and following its lead. It was home to overland trade routes with India. To the west in what is now Turkey was a set of similar cultures, most notable of which were the Hittites that rose towards the end of the Bronze Age. Egypt. Ancient Egypt is probably the most famous Bronze Age civilization. Modern Egyptology started with Napoleon, who took an interest in the pyramids such and hired artists, reporters and scholars to study the ruins, most notably finding the Rosetta Stone that let them decode their written language, and report back to France and has been going strong ever since. It helps that Egypt is a very desiccated place and we have a lot of records buried in the sand.
Like Mesopotamia, Egypt is based around a river which ran through a desert. Unlike Mesopotamia, the river was easy to work with. Between May and August the Nile would flood. Once it receded, the floodplain was both wet and fertile from freshly deposited sediment. In practical terms this meant that Egyptian agriculture was on easy mode. High yields with little work and during inundation people had a lot of free time on their hands, which they often spent building pyramids. There was little point for Egypt in making war, all the surrounding lands were barren desert, and most of their neighbors depended on trade with Egypt for food anyway. This meant the pharaohs could easily afford enough men, horses, and chariots to keep anyone else from getting ideas, at least until the Greeks and Romans showed up. A really outstanding fact about Egypt is that it was remarkably stable. From roughly 3150 BCE to 525 BCE Egypt existed as a political entity without much internal societal upheaval. There were periods of disruption and instability, but they were always fairly brief with people returning to the status quo with pharaohs, priesthoods, nomarchs and so forth. Similarly there was a lot of continuity of culture. A few new technologies were introduced, bronze walking and chariots, but the overall impact on people's day-to-day -day lives was highly limited. It's easy to identify what dynasty an imperial Chinese porcelain plate was made in based on its style or what century a picture of a medieval knight was made in based on his armor. In contrast you would be hard pressed to find the stylistic difference between an Egyptian statue of a pharaoh from 2600 BCE and one from 26 BCE of Caesar. Hell, Augustus's pharaonic statues from around 10 cell look barely different from Nama's palettes from around 3000 BCE. East Asia, the first use of bronze in China is dated at around 3100-2700 BCE although more concrete delineation is a bit difficult due to aforementioned smooth transition to the Iron Age and bronze being in continuous use since it was seen as a fancy material alongside jade. Chinese historians roughly equate early Bronze Age with the Shang Dynasty and late Bronze Age with Zhou Dynasty. In terms of cultural and social sophistication it was basically China light as the various elements that will come to define China were just getting started though as the picture on the left shows they were as advanced as the Egyptians and Sumerians. Korea had begun using bronze by 1000-800 BCE which they adopted from the neighboring Liraning and Manchu cultures though they developed their unique style and culture. The Bronze Age in Korea corresponds generally with the Mumin period during which their societies progressed from isolated villages of pit houses in the classical part to sprawling settlements numbering hundreds of houses secured by several ditch enclosures along with megalithic burial sites. During the late Mumin there was apparently an increase of conflict as the amount of settlements decreased and many transformed into hilltop forts with even more elaborate ditches. At this time iron also started entering use as well. Japanese Bronze Age corresponds roughly to the Yayoi period at around 300 BCE when it was brought by settlers from Korea to northern Kyushu and then spread out northwest. This period was also marked by a complex interplay of migrants from the Korean peninsula and the more native Yaman, the former being displaced by the more Chinese-like northerners. There is however little evidence of conflicts and the two cultures apparently merged and bolstered Japan with new tech and culture. Sounds kinda familiar. Notes. Money did not really exist back then. Peasants would give each other gifts and would do stuff for each other as they could. You give me some pots and I'll fix your roof when I can. Governments paid people wages of food and goods and merchants haggled various goods with local officials, regular people and each other as they went. There were a few things that merchants prefer to deal in which were easier to deal with. Bolts of cloth, ingots of metal, cowrie shells, but it was still an informal matter. This would vanish later, and China, Greece. Egypt and Philistines had all established currency hundreds of years before 1000 BC, possibly earlier. That said earliest forms of money were contrived as aids to accounting by Bronze Age bureaucrats. Since shifting large amounts of grain about from hold to hold is hard work with a shekel being pegged at a bushel of barley. The shift of agriculture meant that humans started needing supplemental dietary soil to live, as well as to preserve meat. 
Salt trade with areas able to mine or harvested in useful quantities would become the first major form of commerce between empires. Many of the more developed Bronze Age societies had many aspects of society organized by the government. The government told peasants what to grow, collected taxes of food and similar from them, took them to central warehouses, gave artisans wages of stuff for making tools and weapons which they would use to pay people and distribute to people who needed them, all of which managed by castes of scribes and nobles. Basically think of the imperial tithe minus most of the grimdark chariots. Animal domestication lead to animals that could pull carts, which were then weaponized. In places where flat land was plentiful, it was very hard to engage in a combat against a wheeled cart that was shooting arrows at you, and even harder if there was a full formation of the things. Cart, animals, trained soldiers, and weapons got expensive in a hurry, though, making these an elite fighting force. Their elite status would lead to them being phased out as the governments that used them hit recessions and horses were bred strong enough to carry a full archer on their back. A lot of what we think of as being part of the classical era has its roots in the Bronze Age. For example, the Egyptians have an extremely long history that stretches from the dawn of civilization to the rise of the Hellenic Empire. Much, much later, and the most famous Greek stories we know of by Homer, were written prior to the classical age in what we know as archaic Greece, and he was talking about a Greece even older than that that was effectively lost to its own dark ages. Much of what we know about this time period comes to us indirectly from the oral traditions of classical poets and historians, especially if the writing system of those societies became lost. The appeal of the Bronze Age. The Bronze Age is the earliest period that we have accounts of, even if they are scant, fragmentary and incomplete. It is in this time that the earliest forms of civilization are gradually taking shape, and we know more of the shapes it took in those formative years than about the specifics of any particular band or tribe of Stone Age people. From big things like the codes of Hammurabi to the fact that some fellow in Mesopotamia around 5200 years ago was named Irihor, to the eye of the romantic, priest kings reign over populations of devoted followers who demand that their legacy be set in stone with great monuments and by fire and blood as they clash for power and prominence. Ranks of spearmen and bowmen march into battle led by charioteers which clash on burning sands with the winners taking the losers as spoils of war. The heroes might be favored faithful servants to their city and their king and the new world that is rising or barbarian warriors seeking glory, freedom and plunder on the frontiers. Their deeds to be remembered in epic poetry, or inscribed into clay tablets by scribes. If we want to get more fantastic, this period has produced complex mythologies with pantheons of squabbling gods and epic tales such as the story of Gilgamesh and the Trojan Wars, all of which are ripe material for a fantasy writer to mine. This is the time period for the sword and sorcery genre, as most of the myths that we know of from the classical period take place in this epoch. This gives the Bronze Age an air of mystique and grand adventure, where larger than life heroes fought against monsters and gods. Something that's generally not possible with the even earlier Stone Age as the culture of that time period is too primitive to tell such grandiose stories, and where survival is really all that's possible. In addition to the above, the Bronze Age is also one of the main influences that gave us the lost ancient ruins trope. We have only very vague ideas of why the Bronze Age ended, and what followed was a long, barbaric time where things regressed hard. Unlike the fall of the Roman Empire and many of the Chinese dynasties, the Bronze Age gives off this sense of complete mystery. Who are these ancient people? How come they disappeared? And how could they have been so advanced? In popular fiction culture, those lost civilizations are often eventually revealed to have been decadent priesthoods who built insanely huge monuments and made outstanding crafts. Relics and MacGuffins our heroes and villains can fight over, but had some large flaw that was their downfall. Apart from the relics of incredible power, the Bronze Age has all these features. The people of the Bronze Age had a very tangible relationship with their deities, constructing temples and shrines on scales seemingly beyond the means available to them, and begging the question whether forces beyond the knowledge of history played a part. 
fantasies of aliens visiting Earth in the distant past and being received as gods by primitive humans are lent an air of credulity by the enormity of the monuments the ancient empires left behind. Not the part where all pyramids look the same though. The only thing that lends credulity towards is the fact that that is simply the best way to lay down a huge structure without concrete or steel. In the Bronze Age, a rough template for a social order for agrarian societies would be outlined. There would be city-states and kingdoms whose population would be divided up into various largely hereditary classes of kings, nobles, priests, scribes, warriors, artisans, merchants, peasants and slaves, most of whom were rural supporting a few urban centers. Wealth was mostly calculated in terms of food and agricultural productivity. Most people never travel more than 20 kilometers from the place of their birth. Work would be done mostly by hand with some applications of animal power and a few instances of utilizing winds and running water, boats with sails and traveling downriver. While there would be exceptions, significant changes within these parameters and a lot of variations on the theme, this setup would predominate until the Industrial Revolution, Bronze Age inspired games, factions and settings, Conan the Barbarian, Tomb Kings, Stargate, Mythic Vistas, this series of splat books by Green Ronin started with Testament. A fairly beefy splat book centered around Bronze Age historical fantasy using the biblical era as its starting region. So I hear you guys are into thick big titty wafers. Well we got you covered at nickbedlier.co.uk. One stop shop for coom jar models. However we do sell a lot more than just smart models we got everything for running any fantasy settings and even some not grim dark science fiction models. In fact we even have some anime inspired models and video game. But if models is not your thing we also have some role playing adventures and DND 5e meme subclasses. Also every video we will be giving away all our homebrew content to a subscriber of the channel. All you got to do to be in with a chance is subscribe. Today's winner is this guy. Well done. Claim your prize by contacting us via email at nickbedeercontact at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the video. Classical period. In the Mediterranean world Futtal Crescent the Bronze Age is often said to have ended rather abruptly in a massive calamity called the Late Bronze Age Collapse. Advanced civilizations which had cities, written language, Mathematics and fine products that had stood for thousands of years were swept away or faced major setbacks rather suddenly around the 12th century BCE. Exactly why this happened is a matter of contention and probably not just one thing. Crop failure, foreign invaders, often called the sea people, civil unrest and compounding breakdowns were most likely part of it, but regardless the result of which was that society took a fair number of steps back. But things bounced back as a new set of civilizations came about, though considerably different ones from what came before in Greece, the Levant and Italy around 800 BCE or so. Thus began the Classical Period. The Classical Period is the time of the Greek city-states and the Roman Republic and Empire and lasted to about the 5th century so. What started out as a few minor city-states here and there grew into civilizations which would flourish in art philosophy, engineering, architecture, medicine and more. While many of these states would have kings at various points in their history, there was also a fair deal of experimentation with various forms of elected government. Even as the classical period would come to an end with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, the classical period is firmly the Iron Age. Iron had been worked before, meteoric iron had been worked every now and again for thousands of years and occasionally a few skilled craftsmen in the Bronze Age could make a few bits of it even though it was brittle and expensive and mostly used as a sign of status. King Tut was buried with an iron dagger for such reasons. Near the Bronze Age collapse the Hittites had begun smelting and working iron on a larger scale for more practical purposes such as tools and weapons. But it was only after the collapse that iron working really became common. Iron has a higher melting point than copper and the simple wood fired furnaces of the Bronze Age just were not up to the task of processing it in meaningful amounts. If you make a large tube furnace, feed it charcoal, iron ore and oxygen with bellows, 
You can get it just hot enough to end up with lumps of semi-molten iron goo that can be forged. Regular iron was comparable to bronze in quality for many purposes, but unlike bronze which required two rarer metals that you often had to trade for, iron ore was common as muck. Even so, bronze still found a fair bit of use well into the classical period. After all, the big deal about iron swords is not that they are better than bronze ones absolutely speaking, but now everyone in your army can easily have one. Notes. This whole deal is a western thing. In China and India and so forth things were going along their own paths removed from all this. Though it should be pointed out that roughly around the same time that Rome existed, the Qin and Han dynasties united China for the first time, being their equivalent of a foundational regime that would set political and cultural precedents for centuries to come. Before the West was done with this era though, the Han collapsed and China entered the bloody Three Kingdoms period before being formed into the Jin dynasty. During this time in Japan the Yayoi period, starting around 1000 BCE, happened as migrating people from the mainland came to the island chain assimilating the earlier semi-agricultural Jomon peoples and is considered the start of Japanese civilization as we'd know it. Writing became more common during this time period. Beforehand in the Bronze Age literacy was the domain of scribes and a few priests and nobles and existed primarily for purposes of administration first and religious purposes second. In the classical world it was fairly common for men and women who were not at the bottom of society to know their letters and using them much more widely, probably because the Phoenicians developed the basics of phonetic writing during the Dark Age and it's easier to learn a few dozen symbols that represent short sounds than hundreds of symbols which represent syllables and words. Literacy would decline after the classical period. Navies emerged as states realized the advantages of traveling over water as opposed to land and pirates and enemy ships had to account it for. Philosophy and political science were at the fore. Every conceivable society was attempted, from Athenian democracy, to monarchies and oligarchies, Rome's landed cities and republic, the theocratic dynasties in Egypt and the brutal warrior communes of Sparta. Every society was aware of the growing masses in the cities and the need to keep the populace placated, whether through expanding franchise, brutal tyranny, manipulative privation, brazen demagoguery, pain amid circumstances, or a combination thereof. The iconic marble statues were originally painted with colorful paints. The paints have just decayed much quicker than the stone they covered. The appeal of the classical period frankly the modern world has a serious boner for this period. The link we have to the Bronze Age cultures is a bit tenuous at best, but the West sees the Greeks and the Romans as our forebearers. People like the idea of Greek philosophers discussing and debating the nature of the world and morality, of Romans forging order from chaos spreading civilization and building magnificent buildings that stand to this day, Athenian democracy and Spartan military excellence. Of course that view is overly romantic and overlooks the nastier side of the period, from slavery to rampant xenophobia and sexism, especially with the Greeks, to the fact that this could be a rather brutal period with a lot of pig-headed stupidity at the time. Many people have tried to emulate the better notions and build on them, it helps that we actually have a fair bit of information about this time from first-hand accounts. Historians have to pass through a smattering of tablets and decorations on walls for the Bronze Age, much of which they can't read. In this period we have a good index of this time period, from Greek poems and plays to biographies and histories. Even if said writings aren't very objective, they makes filling in the blanks a hell of a lot easier and gives us insights into a lot of different people which means we have a lot of characters to get insights on how people got along back then. Finally there is something of a mix the modern and the ancient and the classical age that you don't get in the medieval period. In Rome people lived in apartment blocks, had sewers to take away their filth, had theatres and coliseums to keep them distracted, and, if they had said status, had a conception of their role in society as citizens with legal rights and listened to political rhetoric and heard satire that's not too different from what someone in a first world country would hear as opposed to how a medieval peasant or knight would. Bob every Roman puts in a hard day's work selling olive oil so that when game day comes around he can go down to the arena with his brass.
drink wine and bet on the gladiators. Mind you this stuff existed in a world where slavery was normal and unremarked on. Romans unironically complained about all the slaves taking their jobs and some portion of them actually had a point. The modest farmers who got screwed by big landowners and aristocrats who bought them out while they were at war and then used their slaves to profit off of the land ended up creating a big urban poor population that was the cause of many of the late republic problems. Having criminals fight to the death was seen as prime penology and good entertainment, and people sacrificed sheep so that next year's grape crops would yield a prime vintage was a regular part of religious lives. Dark Age. The Western Roman Empire is generally said to have fallen in 476 A, which was in of itself part of a long gradual decline as the empire fell for a wide variety of internal and external reasons which are beyond the scope of this article and indeed are still extensively debated by historians. The central government broke down. Barbarians tribes such as the Huns, the Vandals, and the Goths invaded and took over and many urban centers that grew under Roman rule withered on the vine as their people fled to the countryside and a fair bit of higher learning was lost in Western Europe. For the sake of curating this marked the end of the classical period period which lasted until about 1000 or so called the Dark Ages. During this time warlords carved out new kingdoms, handing conquered lands out to their favored warriors as they went who tax peasants and used that money to buy mail and helmets and horses, gradually morphing into the first knights. They also made alliances with the Catholic Church, which arose from the ashes of Rome offering its services and placating the peasants, rebuilding society and doing things that required book learning in exchange for their aid in spreading the faith. A say in the way things were run and various other privileges. Invasions starting around the early 700s. The relatively new Umayyad Caliphate had begun conquering Europe, seizing nearly all of Spain. While the other Mediterranean European countries were under the protection of the Byzantine Empire, the south of France was vulnerable and became the site of significant clashes between the local Frankish tribes and the invading Muslims. During this time period, Frankish statesman Charles Martel was able to rally the Franks at the Battle of Tours and beat back the invasion. His grandson Charlemagne would succeed in uniting the remainder of Western Europe under the Carolingian Empire, the closest the West had ever been to a unified state since Rome. While the empire didn't last, it laid the groundwork for the two future states of France and the Holy Roman Empire. Around 793 the Vikings began to show up and would remain an active element for centuries to come. While most of these attacks were short yet violent raids for the sake of pillaging and taking slaves, eventually the Vikings conquered a sizable chunk of England and established the Dane law, ensuring a long-term presence that would last even after the English petty kingdoms ousted the Norse warlords. France fared somewhat better as the French monarch was able to convince the invading Vikings to settle down and own the province of Normandy in exchange for their fealty. This would have long-term consequences as the Normans ended up claiming the English crown for themselves, leading William the Conqueror to invade England in 1066 and claim it for himself. This typically marks the end of the Dark Ages and the beginning of the High Middle Ages as the various European powers were finally starting to stabilize and more formal governments was being made. It's also the point where the iconic heavily cavalry in full armor became a thing, as Stira made cavalry considerably more practical, while male armor began to encompass more of the body than the mere chain shirt that had existed since Roman times. Notes this is a Western European thing. Byzantium, China, India. Persia and eventually the Islamic Caliphates were, on the whole, doing quite well at this time. After all, this was the era that played host to the meteoric rise of Islam as both a world religion and temporal superpower. In Europe, Byzantine Empire had it quite well under Justinian that strove to restore the old empire, financing and patronizing religious, cultural and scientific advancement of the state. It is under his rule that famous Hagia Sophia was constructed. However, most influential and lasting legacy of his was the unified and complex codex of laws, known as Corpus Iuris Civilis, that combined both older Roman laws and Justinian's own innovations. While it would be lost and abandoned by the West after the Great Schism, 
it was revisited by Napoleon, who used it as the basis for the Napoleonic Code of which modern day laws are delivered from. Justinian was doing great until up to half of the entire population died in the plague outbreak named after him and Theodora's death by cancer pretty much broke the last great classical autocrat. After Byzantium and Persia broke each other, the Islamic Empire came and sent them to their inevitable declines. The Caliphate though would go through a golden age that lasted until the Mongols, accepting the Sunni Shia schism and the Abbasids overthrowing the Umayyads. There is also an often overlooked period called the Carolingian Renaissance which occurred from the 8th-9th century and saw flourishing in Frankish intellectual elites in such areas as law, writing, literature, liturgical reforms and arts. China would emerge from a period of political instability, and China had a lot of that, be reunified by the Sui dynasty and thrive under the Tang dynasty, notably developing the imperial bureaucracy based on competitive examination. Meanwhile, Japan was coming into its own as a well-developed civilization with the Nara and Heian periods following China's model. Long story short term Dark Age has become rather contentious in recent decades among historians and at the very least it has been judged that people from the renaissance onward overestimated in how severe the fall was. Many prefer the far less loaded early medieval period to describe this period of history. The real reason we call this period the Dark Age is due to the relative lack of European writings we have in comparison to the ages coming before and after. Between the high political instability and drop in literacy, the only people making books at this time were monks. That's not to say Europe was a total intellectual vacuum. The university was invented in this time period, and would build a network of schools that would really come into prominence once the renaissance hits. There are other periods of time labeled Dark Ages such as the Greek Dark Ages between the Late Bronze Age collapse and the Classical period. Basically whenever an advanced civilization regresses a decent bit due to general decline or some catastrophe. And like the previous point, we know almost nothing about what happened during these periods, especially so for the Bronze Age. The appeal of the Dark Age how do you like your medieval fantasy? Do you like it to be hosher? Grettier and on the cruder side, then the Dark Ages are a good place to mine for ideas. People in shattered isolated settlements where buildings are rough while a king theoretically reigns but the power lies in the hands of local nobles and knights. Viking raiders on longships searching for gold and thralls raiding who do battle with scruffy knights in dirty scale and male who are at best but marginally more civilized than the pagan barbarians with whom they do battle. Both of which are more likely to preserve their deeds in song than with words written down in books. Isolated monasteries of monks copying down a few ancient texts that they cannot read for future generations. You can even work in a bit of a post-apocalyptic vibe with a dark age setting, where people build crude wooden fortresses and barn-like halls exist alongside the remains of more impressive structures of stone from a now fallen empire. Civilization once stood here and it might do so again, but now is an age of turmoil and the sword. Not to say that these guys did not have a creative side. This period is tied in with Celtic spiral patterns and tapestries. In general the aesthetics of the time are more abstract than the classical era before it or the high middle ages and renaissance ahead of it. Dark inspired games, factions and settings this is one of the most used settings in all fantasy. While usually taking a fair degree of artistic liberties, most fantasy authors use the aesthetics of feudalism in one way or another, poor peasants, luxurious, for the time, and corrupt nobility caught stabbing each other in the back, dirty and decrepit cities, barbarians pillaging the remnants of the old empires, a nebulous fight in the frontiers, usually based of the Muslim or Mongol invasions during the Middle Ages. The Kingdom of Britannia in Warhammer FB is clearly inspired in a late version of the Middle Ages Kingdom of France and or England, whereas the Empire is closer to early modern ages Holy Roman Empire. The human kingdoms in the Lord of the Rings also follow a similar aesthetic, although much less grounded in reality and more in fantasy. High Middle Ages. War of the Roses. Chaucer's Tales. The Brutal Feudal System. Holy Crusades. Bubonic Plague. Can't say that we've really missed him. So dark and barbaric. So dull and mundane.
That was so Middle Ages. That was so. Charlemagne. Something rotten. Around the year 1000 the people in Western Europe began to get their shit together and moved out of the Dark Ages. And the 1066 three-way war involving Norwegian and Norman invasions over Britain ending in Norman victory and the coronation of William the Conqueror is generally held as the point where the Dark Age early medieval period ended. The economy steadily improved and cities began to grow again. Though no single state had risen to unify Europe since the Carolingian Empire, individual kingdoms had risen to replace the old tribal confederations. Though feudalism was still the rule of the day, allowing for a degree of political stability, and with it, trade networks grew, skills were honed, new technologies were acquired. Some of these were brought in from the east such as gunpowder, giant hamster wheel powered cranes and paper but others were developed locally such as stained glass and an increasingly wide use of water power. Gothic architecture emerged as cathedrals reached to the sky. While slavery was gradually abandoned in much of Europe, trade in the Mediterranean became more and more profitable, especially to the benefit of the Arab slave trade. The Byzantine Seljuk Wars also happened at this time, which influenced a much more famous later event, the Crusades. Unfortunately the good times did not last as the 14th century was a bit of a doozy. First there was famine, which is never a nice thing. Then in 1346 there was the Black Death which wiped out about a third of the people in Europe with some areas getting hit worse than others. Ironically improvements in trade and the growth of cities with little consideration to public heath made such a die off possible. Small isolated villages hit by plague might be wiped out before it can spread, leaving a ghost town and spooked but healthy neighbors. Cities with tens of thousands of people full of filth, human waste, animal waste, Food scraps, blood from slaughtered animals, dead stray dogs, dead rats which feed on this stuff and other such grodiness, in which carts, barges and ships are always coming and going can go on for some time propagating the plague like a Nurgle machine. However, the Tradiaf was that peasants, being in lower supply, were now more valuable and could now earn wages to lift themselves out of serfdom and earn some, very basic, rights. Medicine also advanced as healers were forced to change their means and methods and had plenty of sick people to practice and try new things on and primitive superstition on that count slowly began to give way out of simple necessity. In Japan the Heian era ended in 1185 with the rise of the Kamakura Shogunate. Except for the short-lived, three years, Kenmu restoration, the emperor would be a powerless figurehead for almost 700 years until the Meiji Revolution of 1868. This is also the era the samurai class emerged. The katana would only appear at the very end of this period with the true form only emerging around 1400. Samurai wore the long Itachi instead. High Middle Age around Europe, the toll from the fall of the Western Roman Empire and the later fall of the Carolingian Empire, plus the raiding campaigns of Vikings, Magyars, and Muslims, left the continent in a weakened state. However, by the time the 11th century started, the feudal economic system was in full effect, and the relative, keyword being relative, moment of peace allowed the cities and kingdoms to begin a process of recovery. Trade and commerce began picking up steam once again, making cities important financial and political points of interests. Likewise, the different monarchies and ruling nobles began a very slow process of recovering their power. The idea of the primus inter pairs, first among equals, was fine and good, but it meant that the kings had little more power, and on many occasions, less effective power, than the nobles they supposedly ruled over. This consolidation of power in the hands of national monarchies was a long, long process that only started coming into fruition at the very end of the period. In the meantime, though, there were many processes of cultural renovation with the birth of the Romanesque and Gothic styles, and even more deep changes with the Gregorian Reformation, the start of the mendicant orders and the spread of the first universities. Different areas of Europe evolved in different ways, though, in the Iberian Peninsula, this period included most of the second half of the Wars of the Reconquista, 
the fall of the caliphate of Cordoba in favor of the Taifas system, basically a fragmentation of power in little independent Muslim kingdoms, was the signal for the Christian kingdoms of the north to kick the reconquest of the south into overdrive. This doesn't mean this was a unified campaign, though. As was usual for medieval kingdoms, backstabbings and general infighting on both sides was abound, but the weakened Muslim kingdom slowly but surely lost ground. Despite briefly unifying themselves under the Almoravids and Almohads, the last Muslim kingdom, the Kingdom of Granada, was conquered in 1492 by the Catholic kings. Meanwhile, the Christian kingdom started their unification process, which would culminate in the marriage of Elizabeth of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon, setting up the basis for the unification of Spain. Meanwhile, Portugal started a campaign of exploration through the Atlantic, which would later be followed by Castile, birthing a competition for the exploration and discovery for route trades to India, and later the Americas, between the two. In the region that was once the Carolingian Empire, the Kingdom of France slowly but surely started gaining territories against the other two members of the Treaty of Verdun, and its ruling dynasties managed to slowly build up the power that had been lost centuries ago. Of particular importance was the Norman conquest of England by the Duke of Normandy, William the Bastard, which became the conqueror after his victory, managed to pull off a successful invasion of England by taking advantage of a dynastic dispute. This generated quite a dilemma for the time, though William was still the Duke of Normandy and nominally a vassal of the French king. In practice he had as much, if not more, power and influence than his lord, which put both of them on a very tense position. The French kings tried to reduce the English monarch's influence in France by limiting the boundaries of their continental possessions, which kept increasing the tensions between the two kingdoms. This situation finally came to a close with the death of the last Capetian without a clear heir to the throne, with no clear ruler and with the English kings having no little dynastic claims to the French throne. He declared war to reclaim the crown against the House of Valois, the other noble family fighting for the French throne, and thus began the Hundred Years' War, which, as its name implies, was fucking long. This clusterfuck of a war, both a massive international conflict, a civil war and a bloody family feud, eventually involved pretty much all active players in Western Europe at one point or another, and, alongside the Black Death and the massive famines that coincided with it, caused a lot of death and destruction. The war kept going on and on until the eventual French victory, managing to drive the English to the other side of the English Channel and starting a rivalry between the two nations that would last for centuries. After this defeat, England immediately became embroiled in another civil war, the War of the Roses. Speaking of England, they went through a lot of upheaval while bickering with France. The new Norman rule had to deal with the nearby kingdoms and a lot of political instability, and then the last heir of the House of Normandy died, which started a civil war which ended with the Plantagenet as the kings of England. During the rule of the famous Richard the Lionheart, that instability continues, especially when the king goes to the Crusades instead of actually taking care of home affairs. His brother John took control of the country after Richard was kidnapped. A move which not only pissed many people off, John was seen as an usurper already, though many historians nowadays see this bad image as the result of his political enemy's propaganda. It gave his rivals the perfect excuse to the disgruntled nobles to rebel against him. John was forced to sign the Magna Carta, a legal document which guaranteed a lot of rights and freedoms to nobility at the expense of the crown. This document is often considered as one of the most important political reforms in history, since it paved the way for modern parliamentarian systems. Even though the original document was never put into practice, only a heavily modified version was eventually applied after many political shenanigans. On the Italian peninsula, the fragmentation caused by the fall of the Roman Empire and the infighting between the different factions was the catalyst for the birth of most of the Italian city-states. 
with the Norman conquest of the Catepinate of Italy, basically a province of the Byzantine Empire in southern Italy. The biggest political power on Italy became the papacy by far, since the young city-state simply couldn't compete with the Catholic Church in political, spiritual and financial power at the time. The church's power was not uncontested, though, on the one hand, pushing for the Crusades had given the Pope quite a lot of authority and prestige all over Christianity, but on the other hand, the concentration of power in the hands of nobility and the national monarchies meant that their earthly powers were questioned by secular authorities. In particular, the papacy and the Holy Roman Empire clashed frequently in this matters, since both papal and imperial powers claimed to represent the will of God in some form, though the dispute centers around their influence on the Dominium Mundi, and more specifically, the temporal powers. The investiture controversy was but the first of the many clashes between these two authorities which would continue all throughout the rest of the Middle Ages. Speaking of the Holy Roman Empire, which was neither holy, nor Roman, nor technically an empire, it was the technical successor of the imperial authority. Also, it was big, the biggest Christian kingdom by far during the High Middle Ages. The Byzantine Empire had lost quite a lot of ground, and would continue to do so during the period. However, despite its size, population and political influence all around it, it was mostly a confederation of German kingdoms and principalities, all with their own rules and customs. The only real cohesive element was the figure of the emperor, and the struggles to get that power were frequent. Thus, it was unable to consolidate its power into a centralized monarchy like France, England or Spain, though it was still the great Christian power of this period, and would continue to be a powerhouse in the following centuries. In the northern parts of Europe, the Scandinavian kingdoms undertook a heavy process of Christianization. After raiding the southern lands for a couple of centuries, many realized that the feudal organization was actually more beneficial than just straight piracy in the long run. Although Viking raids took a long while to disappear altogether, so they adopted Christianity. This process was accompanied by the adoption of modern political systems and customs, which would pave the way for the Viking and German chieftains to actually create proper medieval kingdoms. In particular, the new kingdoms focused on sea trade, since they already had a lot of naval know-how, and agriculture in Scandinavia was a difficult proposition anyway. In particular, they clashed with the Hanseatic League. A group of principalities and other minor states allied in a merchant confederation which tried to monopolize the regional trade. To counter this, the kingdoms of Sweden, Norway and Denmark created the Kalmar Union, with the Queen Margaret I of Denmark ruling over all three kingdoms at once. However, this union didn't translate into the creation of an unified state, dissolving at the beginning of the early modern ages, in the other side of Christendom. The Eastern Roman Empire, or the Byzantine Empire for short, was not in the best shape. It had received a massive mauling during the previous centuries due to the wars against the Persians first and later the sudden apparition of Islam, which took away most of its territories in northern Africa and the Middle East. It was the fast advance of the Seljuk Turks over Anatolia which forced the Roman Emperor to ask for help to anyone that he could find, and considering they had broken with the Roman Church very recently, it was interpreted as a massive sign of weakness everywhere, which led directly to the Crusades. While the Crusades helped the Byzantines stabilize their eastern borders by funding the Crusader kingdoms, Byzantine territories like Bulgaria managed to gain independence. And then the Fourth Crusade happened, which instead of going to the Holy Land to fight the infidels, it ended up besieging and raiding Constantinople itself to pay off some Venetian loan sharks. By the time the Byzantine emperors could retake the capital, they'd lost most of their territories elsewhere, which left the Eastern Roman Empire as a vestigial state whose only advantage was its geographically advantageous position. Still, by 1453 the Ottomans managed to finally capture the remains of the empire, which was basically just Constantinople by this point, signaling the end of whatever was left of the Roman Empire of old. In Central and Eastern Europe, the last big processes of Christianization took place, 
from Bohemia to Lithuania to the Rus kingdoms. This allowed a lot of expansion and modernization of this new kingdoms. And then the Mongols arrived. The arrival of the Mongols to Eastern and Central Europe signals a massive power shift in the area, since the Mongols managed to defeat and conquer many of the European kingdoms. The European tactics that favored heavy cavalry were catastrophically outmaneuvered against the light archer cavalry of the Mongols, especially in the great open plains of Central and Eastern Europe. Bohemia, Hungary, Bulgaria and Lithuania were badly hit by this assault, and the Rus kingdoms were outright conquered and annexed to the Mongol sphere of influence. The death of the Mongol leaders stopped the invasions from going further. Mongol influence was only shaken off from this area after a long process of fighting by the early Russian Tsars. After the Mongol Khanates were pretty much defeated, the main concern of the kingdoms from Eastern Europe became the Ottoman Empire. Since the Turks had managed to advance upon the territories from the former Byzantine Empire, which would mark the history of the region with constant clashes during the early modern age. Also, during all of this, this area was squarely hit by the Black Plague in the 14th century, just as the rest of Europe was. But unlike the Western Kingdoms, where peasants managed to wrestle some limited concessions to the nobles due to the fact they were becoming pretty scarce, the exact opposite happened here. Many Russian nobles managed to reinforce their authority over their peasant population, in which some historians know as the Second Serfdom, which would strengthen the nobility's grasp over the peasants. This system was so strong that it would survive for over 500 years and would only finally be abolished for good in the Russian Revolution in 1917. Only for the communists and Putin's Russia to continue it in far less obvious ways to the present day. Islamic Golden Age. The Islamic Golden Age is a period that occurred during the Abbasid Caliphate between 750 and 1258. As you can expect the Muslim world was doing very well during this period. The Abbasid Caliphate during the reign of Harun al-Rashid was the largest and most powerful polity in the world. Meanwhile, in the realm of the sciences, the Muslims were making use of a lot of the classical knowledge they had seized and expanded on it. During this time the Islamic world saw major advancing in terms of science, primitive chemistry from alchemical traditions in particular, medicine, mathematics, there's a reason why they call them Arabic numerals, the reason is that they were introduced to Europe through Arabs, though the numbers themselves originate from India, technology, optics, ceramics, architecture, windmills, art, a lot of Islamic art relies on geometric patterns given the religion's taboo about images due to fear of idolatry, so having trigonometry was a big boon here, and trade. At the heart of it was Baghdad being a center of learning and a large thriving urban center, yet not far behind were cities like Samarkand, Damascus, and Cordoba. Unfortunately, the Crusades and the Mongols put a stop to it and trashed up a lot of the Middle East. However, the spirit of this era, of scientific advancement and glorious conquest, would live on past the fall of Baghdad, in places like Mughal India, and the Emirate Caliphate of Cordoba in Spain. Khmer Golden Age. While Europe wallowed in the grim dark Middle Ages, half a world away in what is now Cambodia the city of Angkor was busily becoming a, short-lived, paradise on earth. The Khmer were Hindu at the time and Angkor was constructed as a massive temple and urban area encompassing over a thousand square kilometers, complete with canals and two hand dug reservoirs that are easily visible from space and capable of holding a hundred million cubic meters of water. The entire complex is larger than New York City and at its height may have had over a million residents. The good times ended when they went full Buddhism. Notes. This is the high points of chivalry, when an armored knight on horseback had been refined into a truly devastating force. Battles were generally won or lost by the strength of the heavy cavalry that one side could bring to bear. This is the golden age of castles. Any lord of any significance would put together a stone castle to consolidate his position and the design of castles advanced from simple marts and baileys to what most people would think of when they heard the word castle. They were also very resilient, not only to bombardment by siege engines or attempts to storm them, but had granaries and water supplies to weather sieges of at least months and often years.
Warfare in this age was mostly a matter of fairly small parties of knights, in the ballpark of 100, raiding villages and merchants in the other guy's territory and armies besieging castles. Large armies with thousands of men clashing with each other out on the open did happen, but was the exception rather than the rule. That said, warfare was fairly constant during this period. There were always some squabbling city-states, obstinate lordlings making a fuss, armed trade dispute, succession interregnums with rival heirs, blood feuds or clash between a couple of the bigger kingdoms happening somewhere in Europe, as well as a lot of banditry. Cannons and firearms begin to show up in Europe around the late 13th century, though both were crude affairs largely of marginal use compared with more traditional muscle-powered weaponry. While hardly a unique feature to this period or Europe people at this point thought in terms of knowing their place. In medieval society what role you had was largely determined by birth. Some people did the telling and the rest did what they were told. Medieval peasants by and large did not care much about government policy unless it directly and overtly affected them. It was not their business, there were other people out there which knew better than them which should know what to do and that their judgement had God's backing. This is not an absolute mentality. They did have an idea that there were obligations that nobles needed to fulfil to their subjects and if they were pushed or abused too much they would riot. But it is a major distinction that people should consider when trying to get into the mind of a medieval peasant or lord. The portrayal of this time period as having dure, muted colors is completely inaccurate. Dyeing was a rich industry and while natural dyes had a relatively limited color range, red, blue, yellow, brown, indigo, green, pink, and orange were all common. It was abundant and middle class or higher non-clothing items were generally decorated. Clothes were restricted to, at most, simple patterns as the methods of washing clothes when delicates friendly. A large portion of this perception comes from period art, where colors have faded and centuries of grime, which can't be removed without harming the work, has accumulated. This actually applies to many periods of history, but the Middle Ages are most the frequently victimized of it. The appeal of the High Middle Ages. How do you like your medieval fantasy? Do you like it more refined and heroic? With beautiful gothic cathedrals with stained glass windows and mighty castles of stone with fluttering banners full of fat friars and proud knights? or scholarly sultans and zealous hashish and more your type of deal. Well this period is for you. Not that it was all lollipops and sunshine. The nobles were still playing their games of thrones and dynastic squabbles plus there were the crusades, Islamic marauders, and endless feudal wars. The fact that it's the point where gunpowder just barely coming also helps it as the standard point of development where medieval stasis work takes place. Being a serf or a Jew in the path of these armies at this time sucked. The mix of medieval splendor and brutality makes for a nice contrast. The classical civilizations fell, the dark age of turmoil that resulted is over. Beauty and refinement are on the rise, but the sword is still the rule of the world, if not every day as it used to be. This period also gave us some heroes such as Robin Hood. And though King Arthur has his roots in the Dark Age when the native British were fighting against the invading Saxons, his popularity massively took off thanks to Norman literature and adapted by countless countries across Europe. High Middle Age inspired games, factions and settings. A Song of Ice and Fire, Renaissance, Roman Boos. The Renaissance is a period of time and history which had its origins in the 1300s in Italy and would gradually spread across Christdom and beyond. It started with scholars like Petrarch, Boccaccio, and Dante, who came across some old pre-church Latin writings and thought to themselves that it was really great stuff. They then started writing more things in homage to the ancients sparking off an entire movement. As more people took an interest in those ancients, they started to uncover things, and make art and other objects in emulation of them. It's also around the time that people began to think about history. This is where we get terms like Dark Ages, Middle Ages, and Antiquity, applied to the nascent concept of periodizing history before what they would regard as the Renaissance. The word roughly means rebirth in English. More specifically it refers to the revitalization of civilization after the medieval period.
Various Italian city-states gradually grew in wealth and prominence through maritime trade as well as connections with Byzantium and the Middle East and banking. The merchant princes of Italy would invest that wealth to make more money, but also into grand architecture, the arts, literature, engineering and academics ranging from studies of the classical period to natural philosophy, things which were seen as noble pursuits in their own right but they were also as signs of wealth and prestige and ways of currying favor with other influential figures. The cardinal would be glad to back your bid after your magnificent assistance on the new cathedral. Eventually, ideas from Italy would begin to spread out and took root elsewhere in Europe. Cities once again began to grow across Europe. Political happenings this was fine and dandy in of itself, but in coincided with other big changes. Kings began to consolidate power for themselves with a mind of keeping the squabbling vassals in line. Guns were making an increasing impact on the battlefield. In Spain, the Spanish managed to drive the Muslims out of Iberia in the Reconquista and emerge as a new powerful European state. Not too long after that, thanks to improvements in ship design and navigation methods, Vasco da Gama sailed around Africa to India and later an Italian guy named Columbus set out sailing west across the Atlantic to prove to the ignorant masses that world was round that you could get to India by circumnavigation without starving to death first and ended up finding the Caribbean, thus beginning the colonization of the new world began by the Spanish and Portuguese at first, followed by the French. Dutch and English later. Add to that some religious upheaval which shook the foundations of Christendom in the form of the likes of Hussites and eventually the start of the Protestant Reformation and you got a turbulent period of upheaval, to say the least, ultimately culminating in the Thirty Years War, which was the first time people not directly victimized started realizing that maybe this war thing isn't all that good. It took a thorough ass fucking of the continent and the lesson didn't stick. The broad strokes of the renaissance wars were that the protestants and catholics hated each other, each side bringing in more and more forces until the entire continent was ablaze. This is also the period where modern day political thought was put in shape with Machiavelli's magnum opus The Prince, bringing concepts such as pragmatism and balance of power to the forefront. An ostensibly religious war would lead to hilarious abominations like Catholic France, de facto run by Cardinal Richelieu at the time, no less, allying with Protestant Swedes, that exterminated large portions of Germany, against Catholic Habsburgs as alliances shifted, physically and politically at the center of all this, the Holy Roman Empire was a shitstorm for most of this era and had mostly themselves to blame. They kept trying to rule the French but the French had their one really competent king who refused to die. Meanwhile the Pope was having problems with the English, who also had their one really competent king who didn't like the Pope telling him he couldn't have a divorce, along with his daughter, who was even better at the job. The Spanish colonize everything, found a literal mountain made of silver and built the biggest overseas empire ever seen only to lose it all to dynastic struggle, inflation and industrialization. The Venetians were making shit tons of money dominating the Mediterranean, the Swiss were killing people for money, and the Italians were killing each other over who was the more Catholic, and with few exceptions, almost every one of them be at one point fighting against, and at another point allied with, every other one. It was that crazy. Protestantism The Christian denomination of Protestantism also emerged during this time. Depending who you ask, Martin Luther was either an enlightened reformer or whiny rules lawyer. He definitely was a massive antisemite even by the standards of his time. Though, he started out as a Catholic monk but got fed up with the degree of brazen corruption the Pope was endorsing in the clergy's deviation from the tenets of Christianity. Luther wasn't the first Catholic to call out the corruption, but he was the most noticeable and proactive. So after nailing a list with 95 criticisms to a cathedral door, Luther decided to start his own practice of Christianity, without blackjack or hookers. This went about as well as you'd expect, he was declared a heretic and hunted as a renegade. But what the Pope and Habsburgs hadn't counted on was how incredibly unpopular they'd made themselves over the years. You may have heard of the Borgia family and how they got away with some pretty brazen acts while they controlled the papacy, including bribery, incest, 
and murder. The truth is, the papacy had been in severe trouble for many centuries, including a period where the papacy was too tightly controlled by the French that they relocated the seat of the popes and the apostolic Rome to the backwater town of Avignon and, as a result, three people claimed to be pope at the same time, when the hold of the French king started to loosen up a little. Lutheranism and its more radical strains like Calvinism ripped through the Dutch, German, and Austrian parts of the Holy Roman Empire, making it essentially ungovernable as a single whole. Not that the Holy Roman Empire was ever whole to begin with, even before Spain came into the picture, Protestantism also started making inroads into other countries. Radicals Wingians and Calvinists set up in Geneva and Zurich. Establishing theocratic regimes where all forms of fun, dancing, excessive eating, drinking, were strictly forbidden. It swept into France, where it intersected with power struggles among the nobility for the throne to nastily split the majority Catholic kingdom. This might have been crushed had it not been for one nation. England was ruled by Henry VIII who was a devout Catholic but wanted his marriage annulled. His only living children were daughters and his wife was too old to produce more children. And there was a major roadblock to getting it. He'd gotten the Pope's personal dispensation to marry his sister-in-law after his brother had died and asking for a reversal meant sending a message to the Pope, who was at the time a prisoner of the Holy Roman Emperor, his wife's nephew. It wasn't looking like a good idea to send a hey, your uncle wants to divorce your aunt because they have no sons, pass this on to your prisoner message. So Henry got the Archbishop of Canterbury to step in and give him the annulment, which meant breaking with the Roman Catholic Church and forming his own religion. This was further reinforced by his daughter, who essentially made the monarch the head of the new religion and forced any clergy to pledge loyalty to the Queen above all else. The average English noble and peasant alike were remarkably on board with this, as the whole England versus the continent mentality was already firmly entrenched from about four centuries of previous wars. However, many Protestants felt that the Church of England was still too much like Catholicism, with its head of state essentially taking the role of the Pope. These Puritans, and the much less violent Quakers, would cause problems for the British Crown later on. But either way, with England the continental Protestants received a potent ally in opposition to Catholicism as the English sided with the Dutch against the Holy Romans, except when they sided with the Holy Romans against the French. Things came to a head with the Thirty Years' War, the first major conflict between the nations of Europe following the widespread adoption of gunpowder. It began with German princes holding more power than the Holy Roman Emperor and Bohemian. Bohemia now being called the Czech Republic, Protestants not wanting to be ruled by an anti-Protestant emperor and throwing a group of imperial ambassadors out of a window, yes, really, in protest. Incumbent Ferdinand II reacted by destroying a Protestant church and his officials started killing Protestant protesters. While nominally the war was over Protestantism versus Catholicism, politicking played an important role in the ever-shifting alliances of the nations involved. For example, despite being devoutly Catholic themselves, France was more concerned with keeping the Habsburgs at bay, and supplied aid to the Protestants in the north, while harshly suppressing their own Protestants as a threat to the French crown. Eventually, the Catholics gave up on retaking their lost territories and agreed to the Peace of Westphalia, which is regarded today as the foundation for national sovereignty. This also tends to mark the end of the Renaissance and the beginning of the early modern period, or the Age of Enlightenment. Meanwhile in the East and the Middle East, we've got the final death of Eastern Rome and the meteoric rise of the Ottoman Empire, undoubtedly the most iconic empire of the period, which established the first modern professional army with the Janissary Corps and thoroughly buttfucked the Balkans for centuries to come. For a time they were the terror of Europe, a bushy bearded, turban wearing Muslim foe against whom Christendom would need to unite in order to survive, while on the high seas. Their allies on the Barbary coast terrorized coastal towns from Italy to Iceland. In that era, their only true rivals were the pesky Habsburgs of the Holy Roman Empire. A major feather in the Ottoman Empire's cap was invading, besieging and taking over the city of Constantinople from the Roman Empire, which was later renamed Istanbul. 
The sultans of Turkey ruled luxuriously from the Grand Palace in Istanbul, surrounded by their massive harems of concubines and armies of viziers. However, by the tail end of this period, the Ottomans' era of rapid expansion would come to an end as the Ottoman state transitioned into a more sedentary imperial policy. In East Asia, the Ming Dynasty has reached the apogee of its power, having sent massive fleets of ships to the west between 1405 and 1433 in a show of power that ultimately came to nothing. It would soon fall into decline as economic problems, troubles at the Mongolian border, the Japanese invasion of Korea, and natural disasters sap the imperial court's ability to keep things together. The breakdown of order near the end of the 16th century led to a growing power vacuum that would be exploited by a confederation of Jurchens under the banner of the Asian Jiro clan, soon to be known as the Manchu. After spending decades building up their strength, the newly proclaimed Qing dynasty get their opportunity when a massive peasant revolt captures Beijing, leading to the suicide of the last Ming emperor in 1644. With the help of a turncoat Ming general, the Qing sweep into power and fully consolidate themselves as the imperial sovereign of what we now know as China. Not wanting to associate with those they still considered barbarian, the Joseon dynasty of Korea shut its doors for the next couple hundred of years. One thing worth noting is that after the Ming, and later Qing, secured their power, they decided that the Middle Kingdom was too good for everyone else and isolated themselves from the rest of the world. Apart from demanding tribute from nearby countries, a time honored Chinese tradition, at the time, they could genuinely claim that they were the most advanced society on the planet, but this closing off to foreign ideas would have major consequences in the following centuries. It also caused a butterfly effect on European trade, the only way to acquire Chinese goods was to pay for it in gold and silver, though eventually trading in European firearms technology. In turn, this fueled European colonial ambitions in the New World, and eventually imploding the Spanish and Chinese economies once the silver supply dried up. Further east, the Renaissance contains the part of Japanese history most people care about, the Sengoku Jidei. This is the part where they cut each other to pieces with swords and shoot holes in each other with guns, as opposed to the other parts where they cut each other to pieces with swords or the one part where they do both to others. Japan comes into contact with the wider world outside of Asia, as the Portuguese landed on their shores, bringing Jesus and guns with them. The late Sengoku would be strongly influenced by the latter, as Japanese warlords seeking an advantage over their rivals adopted firearms into their armies, which contributed to the rise of massed armies of Ashigaru conscripts under Oda Nobunaga. Nobunaga was well on the way to uniting Japan under one leader for the first time in forever until his loyal retainer Akechi Mitsuhai turned on him for unclear reasons. Nobunaga's Lieutenant Toyotomi Hideyoshi finished the job and decided to invade Korea, which failed largely because of the naval expertise of Admiral Yi Sun Sin. When Toyotomi died in 1598, his son Hideyori's regents fought each other for control. The winner was Tokigori Yasu who was declared shogun in 1603. Iyasu abdicated in 1605 and passed the role to his son Hidetada, but retained de facto political power. When his army killed Hideori in the 1615 siege of Osaka, there were no challenges to Tokugawa rule. Iyasu's 1614 Christian expulsion edict forced out all foreign missionaries and traders except for a small Dutch trading post likely to ward off European colonial interests in Japan. After Iyasu's grandson upheld the ban, the Bakumatsu period began. Notes for the average peasant in the Renaissance the changes were as a rule not so great and usually weren't even noticeable. As far as they were concerned beautiful paintings, fine statuary and magnificent architecture were all well and good and they'd admire them if they had the opportunity to see them but for all of that the grain still needed to be harvested and the cows still needed to be milked just like in their grandfather's day and as their grandchildren would do after they passed they were more likely to be conscripted into a new army if war came but this was hardly a world shattering event for most people and not something they would be inclined to see as an improvement Infantry returned to prominence during this period, 
new weapons such as arbalest crossbows, matchlock arquebuses, and pikes played a role in this, as did cheap munitions plate, but more importantly, the Nat armies became more centralized and systematic than the old feudal systems as the beginnings of standing armies began to take shape. The nobility generally resisted this when they could since it meant that the crown could boss them around more, but the general trend was well underway because these forces were just better at fighting wars. Cannons also played a role in the process, as did navies, though artillery would take some time to come into its own. Cannons destroyed castles, literally and figuratively. Cities stopped extending their walls and started growing around them because there was no point. The sorts of walls needed to stop cannons meant static defenses after this era would be purpose-built fortresses guarding invasion choke points. This was a golden age for mercenaries. Raising and maintaining a standing army was time consuming and expensive and as such if a king wanted extra soldiers for a war it was usually cheaper for him to hire out one or more companies of battle hardened troops for a campaign for a standing rate, rations and a cut of the plunder for the conflict. Production guilds and workshops begin using early mass production techniques not seen since Rome, supporting larger militaries, with larger price tags. The Venetian arsenal is said to have been able to build new merchant ships in a day using prefabricated parts. The Dutch begin their 500 year war to push back the sea using windmills. This inadvertently leads to the invention of modern banking, insurance, and fractional share investing. Feudalism began to decline as the idea of the nation state started to take root. Nationalism would become more prominent in the early modern period to coincide with the Enlightenment, but for now, modern countries were starting to take shape, as people began to think of their homelands as distinct cultural geographic regions instead of the property of ever-changing noble families. At the same time though, this was when the infamous Habsburg family would come to power and control a good chunk of Europe, owning Spain, the Holy Roman Empire, Austria, and all territories owned by those states. While many classical texts had been lost in the West, many had been preserved in the East, with some advances in the sciences provided by scholars under Muslim rule. These texts returned to Europe due to increased trade with the East, which started with the Crusades. If you wanted to be educated, you had to be well versed in Greek, Latin, and even Arabic. With the fall of Constantinople at the hands of the Ottoman Empire, many Byzantine scholars escaped to Italy, including some members of Palaiologoi, the last imperial dynasty, bringing the knowledge preserved in Byzantine Empire to the West, which played a key role in Renaissance. The printing press made its debut, ensuring that all those rediscovered classics spread very quickly throughout Europe as the first modern universities took shape. The appeal of the Renaissance The Renaissance is the closing of the Middle Ages. A lot of its mechanisms were still in place in various forms, but things were beginning to change. There were knights in shining armor and there were still formidable battering rams, but they were facing new competition from pike squares and arquebusiers in a rather distinctive combo. Chivalry was gradually on the wane even as armor plates were forged proofed against shot. All the while there was a lot of shrewd political scheming and intrigues. Why mobilize a thousand lovers and a hundred knights to kill someone when a few drops of poison or a well placed stiletto could accomplish the job cheaper and with far less fuss the game of dynastic power is still being played, but with a rules update that favors a more subtle style. At the same time, mechanics and engineers were tinkering and contriving a wide variety of new machinery. If one was to ascribe a heroic ideal to the Renaissance it would be the Renaissance man, an archetype reflected in the likes of Leonardo da Vinci, a brilliant engineer, scientist and artist all rolled into one. On the battlefield, the men of power were beginning to take notice of these new novelties and so active patronage of inventors was encouraged. At the same time, explorers and conquistadors carve their place in history by finding new lands settling them and conquering Bronze Age societies. For those who want to see what da Vinci could have accomplished if he was more of a mad scientist, that is, if his tanks and other war machines were actually built, Clockpunk has you covered. In general, if you like your medieval fantasy to have a dash of the modern in it, the Renaissance is where you look for ideas. Besides, 
The stuff associated with this period is frankly pretty. This period is listed as an art history thing more than anything and it did provide plenty of classics. William Shakespeare operated at the tail end of this period as well, though since he was a big classics nerd many of his plays dealt with earlier time periods. Renaissance inspired games, factions, and setting some human nations in Warhammer fantasy battle tend to be heavily renaissance themed in technologies. The most obvious example is the Empire with its Da Vinci flavored steam tanks and extensive use of firearms. Same can be said about Kiev in some ways, as it's mostly inspired by Ivan the Terrible Russia and even has Streltsy unit that were historically introduced during Ivan's reign. In Mordium and Total War, Warhammer, Nippon, See the reason below, partially Tilia and Estalia, Tilia has Roman influence too, and politically Estalia reminds of medieval Spain, and, most likely, Marienburg. The exceptions are non-human, with probable exception of dwarfs, and chaos factions, painfully medieval Britonia, most likely medieval Cathay and Araby, and lastly inspirationally uncertain border princes and kingdoms of Ind. Virtually any Japan analog as nobody, not even the Japanese, cares about pre-Singoku Japan, except maybe the Mongol invasions, as a setting and nobody makes settings modern enough to have a post sokoku Japan analog. Seriously, when the Meiji Revolution happened it was like one night you'd go to sleep and it's Japan as it's always been for forever, and the next morning you wake up and there are soldiers in the streets with bolt action rifles harassing people for not building gunpla and buying KFC for Christmas. Galarian Edge is closer to Renaissance than straight Middle Ages.